any other things that you'd like to see kind of changed, you know, talked about more, anything like that within American crit racing right now? Um, I'd enjoy some longer races. <laughs> I mean, why did it drop below like 90 minutes? Um, people are just soft. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Coaches on Couches. Being slouches. So today, we're going to talk. We got, there's a little bit of a, there was a tussle. We'll, just, we'll call it a tussle. Skirmish? Skirmish is good. Skirmish? Yeah, so. It was like UFC 261, <laughs> fight night at the forum, <laughs> happening in Salt Lake City. So we, we wanted to jump on this topic pretty quickly because last week at the uh, American Crit Cup, there was a uh, there was a little skirmish. Some fisticuffs. Came to fisticuffs after the race. Williams and Hernandez threw, threw blows. And uh, it seems like it's kind of been like the culmination of like the words that have been going around for the last, I guess, a while that there's... Uh, a lack of respect, a lack of uh, etiquette in the in the peloton, specifically the American peloton. So we wanted to bring Coach Johnny, in. front row seat. Johnny had the front row seat to Johnny the fisticuffs. Yeah. <laughs> he was actually officiating, I think, at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna ask how you scored it, actually, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> who the winners, the winner and loser was, but not yet. Yeah, we just want to get Johnny's perspective on it since he's really really in there and yeah. uh kind of get an idea of if something really needs to change johnny what like as far as it goes me you've raced all around the world like do you think that there is something inherently wrong with the american peloton right now yeah like even actually the last couple of weeks i've been pretty vocal about it on social media about like there's no, we'll call it like hierarchy in American cycling right now. Like years past, there's always like we had like veteran riders or veteran teams. Um, and they would kind of just like lay the law down. You would either have a teammate that had been around for a while or there'd be like known people inside the peloton. And if you were doing silly stuff, like you'd get told off pretty quickly. Like <laughs> you can't do that. And there's literally... I even, I told somebody the other day, like, I'm like the, the young old guy in the Peloton. I feel like a lot of times, like, normally years pass, a 25-year-old would never be able to tell anybody in the Peloton, stop doing that, that's silly. But now I'm like, quote unquote, one of the most experienced dudes in the races. Um, so there's this, like, people are doing a lot of silly things and there's nobody to tell them, like, you can't do that because you're going to injure all of us. So, so defined, uh, define silly stuff there, JB. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, actually, like, there's a video going around of Boise. Um, a guy decided right before a corner to fully turn around and look behind him, and then he overlapped wheels and crashed. Um, that's that's something silly. Like, if you would have done that in the past, you would have either had like an older teammate or somebody in the peloton being like dude what are you doing like why are you looking behind yourself right before a corner you're gonna overlap wheels and the amount of times i've told people that over the last like six months like what are you doing like, why are you turning turning around because the race is in front of you you're gonna literally you're gonna overlap a wheel and then sure enough overlaps wheels the race had to get neutralized because of it because like 25 dudes went down is that the one that uh clever did clever go down yeah. that one yeah so that's the one that clever went down and then um, one of the riders from that crash got back in the race and then had like no air in his tire. And then another crash was caused because he rolled his tire a couple laps later. I know how that goes. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> that, hit, that hits pretty close to home. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> the flat tire is not good to turn on. That's for sure. Now, going more towards, so obviously looking back, 
not something you want to do, uh, especially as you're approaching a, a corner where you know people are going to be deviating from their line. But as far as like aggressive behavior is concerned, so we saw a post from uh, Thomas Gibbons, and he kind of he, he he essentially alluded to the fact that there's been people spitting on each other, threatening violence. Uh, he, he mentioned how he raced over in Europe for six years, and uh, never once did anyone threaten like physical harm and murder and things like that. Is that something you're seeing or is, uh, or hearing, or is that a bit, uh, over the top there? Well, like there's a few things from that post that he is right about. Like one in particular, he said like, Oh, never in Europe would I like coming into a corner with somebody glance back and see me coming and then just like completely close the door or something like that. And he, he is right about that. Like, but this is where I kind of disagree somewhat because that still does happen. But all that would have, would have been happening when we were juniors and you had like top juniors because I saw it all the time with like Americans would go to Europe as like 15, 16, 17, 18. And they would do these silly things and one of the Euros would just put them on the ground. So they know from like such a young age, you don't do it. So then, of course, the races that Gibbons started doing already, he was older. So, of course, that stuff isn't happening because they, they're they taught at a young age not to do this stuff. Whereas in America, we're not taught any of that. So then by the time they make it to Cat 2, Cat 1, and into the pro, they don't know any better. And then going back to what I said, we don't have any like actual veteran people in the peloton to be like, dude, you can't be doing any of that stuff where now like we have nobody really in the peloton so it's kind of been a free-for-all gotcha i mean at the amateur level i yell at every person i can dale's uh (laughs) we call him we call him old yeller actually (laughs) (laughs) we need we need an old yeller in the peloton there's no old yellers (laughs) i take every opportunity to tell somebody they did something stupid (laughs) (laughs) including my own team yep (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's his that's that's his role actually. Yeah. That's the role we've got. We're like, Dale, you just stay back there in that group yep. and you you police things for yep. us. Just give me my cane afterwards and I'll tell you to get off my lawn. Now you mentioned <laughs> like the whole chopping, like wheel chopping, uh you know, not something that obviously a super dangerous move. Not only for the person that you're doing it to, but every single person behind them. behind them, right? Um we were chatting a tiny bit prior to, uh, to, to going on and, and recording this and you, uh, you mentioned, and it was also mentioned a little bit in, um, in Thomas Gibbons post about kind of the fitness of the Peloton, uh, and how you essentially have what two or three, you know, stronger teams, but almost how the, the pace has come down to a point where, you know, over in Europe, guys who shouldn't be near the front can't get there. Whereas, uh, you know, are you experiencing in in some of these races where people who probably don't have the experience, don't have the legs, don't have the fitness are making their way to the front or the handling ability or the handling ability they've been on and doing, doing Zwift, uh, all off season. Um, like is, is that kind of what you're noticing or is, or is there something else? Yeah. Like, I mean, I wasn't racing these races, of course, like 10 years ago, but, if you bring it back like 10 years, eight years, even six, five years ago, we had so many teams in America and so many guys were actually paid riders that the level was so much higher. And I mean, I watched these races as a young kid and how fast they were going and then how fast I know they were going in these races versus our speeds because there's only really three teams that are like, pretty stout so overall like speeds have come down so then it allows more of these people that in years past would never even be anywhere near the front or near the front like even like a lot of these races we're seeing crashes in the top 10 riders whereas like crashes would still happen in these races but they're always in in the back because it was those same riders were in the back and that's where they were causing it but now they're near the front So now it's like these massive pileups because it's right at the front. Um, So that's where it's kind of changed that way too recently. I mean, you mentioned, uh, and we chatted after the first night of Tulsa Tough, and you had spent the first few laps at 
uh, night one, Tulsa Tough, kind of at the back uh, as things kind of settled in. A few laps later, you're up near the front. And I remember us chatting afterwards, uh, and you said how, like, how crazy it was in sort of that middle third of the group um, and how you were like, dude, this is just not, <laughs> this is just not worth it right now. Um, but the amount of people who were actually doing crazy stuff up near the front, is well, that something you're that, seeing in like, a lot of races or? Well, I mean, especially like any course that's super wide open, it's even more like even more of an issue because then everybody can kind of like, you can sit in the wheels for a second and be at the front. But I mean, that first night at Tulsa is prime example. Every crash happened in the, the top half. Like mm -hmm. every, almost all those crashes were all like top 10 where it's like, what, like what's going on up there. That's all these crashes are happening from there. And not just like a small crash. They're all big crashes. Do uh, you think, do you think it has any, uh, you know, you're saying that there's fewer teams, so you've got a lot more like individual riders that are all trying to like sneak their way into the train and stuff like that. Do you think that that has any part of what's going on here? Yeah. I mean, cause you do have like ones and twos. So then all the bigger teams are going to be right at the front. But then if you have like a ones and twos and this single guy and that single guy, they're going to be trying to snake their way all through that. And then the classic is like, most of these crashes a lot of times are people overlapping wheels too it's like a lot of those crashes in tulsa were like they would be setting up for the corner so they would move to set up for it and then dudes are like trying to sneak all through and they're putting their front wheel where it doesn't belong aka another thing that like nobody's teaching them so they put their wheel where it doesn't belong the, the top five riders are getting ready for the corner so they move out to move into the corner and then these dudes that are in like 10th wheel overlap wheels and then it's a domino effect from there because it's like once one dude goes down right at the front you're so close to each other it's going to cause a big crash. so what so what is like generally speaking uh you know for those who aren't real uh experienced in racing what is the general etiquette for uh you know what line is your line well i think a lot of it too people think you need to be like so aggressive right from the start of the race. So it's like, they say start and it's like, I got to be like right at the front of the whole race. But if you're not going for breakaways or anything, like you can like relax for a little bit and just like roll around in the group. You don't need to be literally like pushing and shoving people five minutes into the race to make sure you're like right behind the Legion train from the beginning um so that's some of it too like people find it the need to be like so aggressive as soon as we start which i've never really gotten because i also like start last wheel and can get to the front no problem so it's like you can move around the bunch fine like you don't have to be up there fighting right from the beginning and then if you're strong enough and good enough as soon as we start going fast in the last five laps you can be there anyways without being all aggressive 15 minutes into the race and like putting your front wheel where it doesn't belong. I mean, to some extent, that's kind of what I feel like that's kind of what Gibbons was saying. Well, actually that was one of the points that he was making is, and this was a, uh, like a little jab at the end was like, Hey, can we get some more technical crits? Uh, you know, because you know, other something other than a four corner crit where it's just power all day. Yeah. Know, yeah, he was essentially well, wanting, yeah, something, for, uh, to quote him directly, can we please, for the love of God, get something other than a flat four-corner crit? You're killing talent ID and development in the U.S., uh, essentially alluding to the fact that, I mean, it's it's pretty easy to sit in on a four-corner wide-open crit, and then you've got people who haven't done anything all race who get near the end of a race, and they're like, wow, maybe – Maybe I am a, a sprinter. Maybe I do have a chance to, you know, throw a good result if I can get up near the front. Whereas if you put those people on a hard, hilly, some sort of feature in the course, more technical that strings things out, I mean, I, I feel like that would definitely keep things safer. What? Oh, one hundred percent. And it doesn't even necessarily have to you don't have to put a hill in it. Like even 
the second day of Tulsa is just tighter. And that changed the whole dynamic. Like you literally just made it tighter. And all of a sudden the race was a hundred times safer because it's tight. We're not going into corners like 10 wide. Mm-hmm. And then it creates kind of a pecking order. Like if you're a good bike racer, you're going to be near the front. And if you're kind of mediocre, you're going to be somewhere in the middle. And if you're bad, you're going to be at the back. So it kind of creates like an actual order. Whereas when they're just these really big, wide open four corner crits, or they don't even have to be four corners. That first night at Tulsa has more corners, but it's so wide and so easy. And we're going into these corners literally with like 10 dudes wide that it's just going to cause chaos. Yeah. Like one, one twitch from the inside causes this ripple effect that yeah. by the time it gets to the outside, folks are jumping three, four, five feet to the left, yeah. even though it was really nothing that happened on the inside. So no, I, I, yeah, exactly. I, I can totally agree with that whole thing. So more, like, more races like, like Tiger Lane here in Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, what? <laughs> Wait, never mind. It's possibly the easiest course in America. Uh, exactly. Now let's, uh, let's kind of go into the actual incident. So you were there, you were racing, you actually had a teammate, uh, Trevieso was in the breakaway. Frank the Tank. Frank the Tank. <laughs> Do you guys call him Frank the Tank? Oh, dude, that's his name. His name is Tank. Heck yeah. Uh, I've been calling him Frank the and Tank. And you do forever. the do you do the arms as well? Like the Frank the Tank arms? What's that? <laughs> From old school. Have you ever seen old school? No. Oh, oh Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> All right, that's, that's your, your homework. Yep, that's, that's your, your homework. That's your job tonight. Watch old school. Uh, so he's in the breakaway. Kind of, kind of run through uh, just briefly. We don't need like a full race recap, but kind of run through how the race was playing out. Um, you know, obviously Legion's there. Uh, you had best buddies there. That's where the incident you know occurs between the, those two teams. Uh, but y'all had a guy off the front. I thought that it was had a chance of sticking. Um, it did not, but if you can just kind of run through, you know, if you saw any aggression during the race, you know, if there was stuff, unsafe stuff that you were seeing, like, was there this buildup over the course of the race or was this something that things just went South the last few laps and, uh, you know, it resulted in fisticuffs afterwards. Um, I mean that particular race, like, I don't know. I had heard there was a lot of crashes and I saw some videos of some crashes, but like that was actually a prime race. Like, Top 10, I don't know. It was fine. Everybody was being fine. Um, we wa- we wanted to race aggressive, like as in like attacking right from the start, because that's the harder the race is, the better it is for us and our sprinter. So Frank got in the break, and then it was pretty chill in the back. Um, and then last five laps, of course, we're doing normal racing and, and you're fighting for position there. But, I mean, for the most part, it was fine it, it was nor we'll call it quote unquote normal american crit racing right now and then um yeah last lap there was the incident between Corey and and michael um and then it kind of it escalated from from there all right so for the folks who haven't seen it kind of run through what what happened that final lap well so you come through the start finish and the start finish was like pretty rough road it was actually, it was really rough road. And then into that first corner, they had this like curb that would come out into the corner some. And then as you'd exit, it was like construction cement wall brick stuff. So it was tight and it was a weird corner and we were ripping. It was kind of gravelly too. And Michael was on the inside and then he tried to kind of skirt in next to Corey and then there's a like a prime video from the rear now. And, and you see as they're going through the corner, Michael gives like a fat flick with his elbow into Corey, which as they're exiting and Corey, his front wheel then turned to the left and he got air. So then when he came back down, well, naturally his bike's going to go to the left and he unclipped during that same process and he went left and that's going to, it took Michael with him. And they both went into the curb. Um, and it was actually like, if you watch the video from the back, it was really impressive that Corey kept it up with his handlebars completely like to the side. Um, and then they go they go into the curb from there. And then you can already see like Hernandez was pretty upset straight from, 
from that moment. And then we took the next corner and somebody crashed. They took themselves out in that corner. And then we, we finished the race um, and Hernandez, we finish and then we do the classic like lap around. And then Hernandez was like sitting there waiting for him, waiting for Legion Deuce to come back around. Um, and then when he came up to him, it, it kind of escalated from there. And you said you were actually doing a cool down lap, right? With, was it Corey or Justin? I was cooling down with Corey like afterwards and he was upset clearly of like Hernandez almost took him out. Um, and then Hernandez is upset at Corey for some reason. He he's trying to say that he Corey took him just to the curb just because, which I don't, I'm not sure how he thinks that, especially after like everything that came out. And it was pretty like <laughs> it's really clear that he's the one that touched Corey. Um, and then. Even afterwards, it's like Corey wasn't looking for an altercation and Michael came up to him all upset. And it, you can see that Corey wasn't looking to actually like, cause an issue after the race. Gotcha. Was it, It I saw the like, I guess there's a million uh, phone, phone um, videos. It looked like, was it Justin who like actually came from behind and threw the haymaker? Yeah, so um, this is like this will be my my personal opinion perspective. Like, I we roll around and Michael comes up like upset, yelling, and then I think it was kind of like a big brother instinct because Justin was just rolling around still, and all of a sudden he he sees Michael just losing it on on Corey, and he of course kind of knows the situation already too of like what happened. So then it was this we'll call like big brother instinct. He comes in thinking like little brother's in trouble and just kind of like does some actions without thinking. And then of course it's going to escalate, but you can see like Corey wasn't looking for anything because after Justin and them start going at it, Corey's the one pulling like Michael off, like let's not fight type of thing. And then even afterwards, like after it kind of calmed down, like Michael and Corey, like Corey was trying to calm Michael down um, and just talk about it. So in, in that instinct, like, Corey wasn't looking for anything. And Michael came over kind of already, like, looking for something. And then Justin just sees his little brother in this situation and kind of, like, acted without thinking. Um, he said, you want a knuckle sandwich? <laughs> you coming looking for a knuckle sandwich? Because I got one for you. <laughs> so um, did, has uh, Nate ever threw a haymaker on anyone for you? Well... No. <laughs> um, uh, so after after that race, so Legion ends up putting a thing out saying how the officials are not doing what they need to be doing to keep the riders safe. They pulled out of the Sunday race. Like, what are your thoughts? You know, you've, you've been doing this whole America's Crit Cup. Like, is this something that you think is on the officials or is this something that's on the actual riders in the race? Um, it would be a mixture of both. I mean, they already knew immediately after we finished. They knew about the incident as we were doing that lap around. So if you already know things are escalating, they probably should have been like aware and been like more present. Like we just want to make sure nothing actually happens type of thing. Um, but then it's, I mean, it's also on the, on the riders too, to have some respect for each other, like in the races and all of that. So what do you think needs to change? Like if you, if you had the magic wand, like you could put pen to paper, what changes would you want to implement if you could, like right away, is there stuff that you're thinking could happen or is this something where, you know, you're going to need some of the more experienced, some of the more veteran folks uh, going back to, you know, days, days past that you talked about where there was sort of a, a hierarchy um, within the Peloton? Well, like these instances are really not on, like in the races, it's not really so much on the officials as it's on us to actually start having some more respect for each other and stop doing these quote unquote silly things. Um, so, I mean, that 
it's going to be teaching people that are doing things that they shouldn't be in the Peloton not to be doing that stuff. Um, and that's not necessarily like an easy thing, especially because I've kind of felt like personally, like so many people in the U.S. Peloton, like when I've said things to them, they either brush it off or like fight with you when you're you're telling them something. I'm like, well, I didn't even tell you like in a bad way. Like I'm actually telling you because I don't want to crash because you're doing something silly in the race. Um, so I think people actually need to start like if an older rider, experienced rider is telling you something, they're probably telling you because they're trying to tell you to help you learn and also try to keep us all safer. Um, so I think people need to be like more willing to actually listen to experienced and yeah, not, experienced yeah, not, ride. not let their ego get in the way and, and accept yeah, a little bit like, of constructive con- criticism. Yeah. And, and it also goes on like the more experienced riders. Like if you're actually going to say something, you don't need to be like, demeaning to these people or like make them feel like they're lesser because they also are out there racing but you can just tell them like a respectful way to like hey man like you probably shouldn't be doing that because x y and z it might cause this so you're doing this and it will cause these issues how many people like are there a lot of vocal folks within i mean i've only done that i did some king thing, but that was it but like that's the thing like say the people that i know personally that are like you're you're a good rider and you know are pretty quiet people too. Like they're not going to like go around telling people like, Hey, you probably shouldn't be doing this. So I, that's, that's kind of some of it. Like these people that have been around for a while aren't quote unquote, like, cause I've, uh, a lot of it, I feel like they also still kind of think they're younger ish and not like these super old experienced people, but mm-hmm. it's like you are now. So like you have to be the one, like, remember when you were starting out and you were 20 years old and there was <laughs> an ex-rider in the Peloton and if you did something dumb, like, they would let you know. Like, you you are that guy now, so you have to start doing that. So is this a conversation you and your team have had? Like, is there conversations with the other teams? Like, Yeah, like, there's. I think it's starting to become more aware because even, um, like, a few of the people that I know that are that, like, it's been like, all right, like, you actually kind of got to, like, we got to start speaking up some. And we can't keep letting these things happen. Like we're, we're letting them happen to ourselves almost. So you just have to be more vocal and actually make sure like this stuff isn't happening. Yeah. It's clearly boiled over at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And people are in, I mean, you know, I guess the good that could come out of this is that this gets talked about more and, you know, your opinion gets out there and the other guys in the, in the American Peloton, their opinions get out there, especially the guys, the experienced guys. And it just gets talked about. And, and then people realize, Oh yeah, I'm, I am kind of riding like a douche. And well, especially like after the videos came out, uh, Boise and the, the kid looking back and then causing that crash, that clever posted the video. And then there was like a lot of comments on it. And, The thing is now with the internet too, and like so many people have GoPros in the Peloton, it's pretty easy to like rewatch the video and kind of see how you're riding too. Um, And you can, this goes for anybody too. It doesn't matter how high of the level you think you are. Everybody can learn something like cycling is always the sport that you are learning and learning new things and how to be a better rider. So even if you think you're the best of the best, you, there's always things you can keep learning and there's always a better rider than you too that you can learn from. So I, I, I cyclist and especially like in the higher levels, just because you're a cat one or a pro doesn't mean that, that you've stopped, that you're not still learning. And that's kind of what people need to keep remembering too. Like you're always evolving as a cyclist and there's always things to learn. Yeah, definitely. One, one question I, have I kind of just started thinking about is so you have the America's Crit Cup last year, you know, it was the USA Crits. Uh essentially it's a a season long cup where you're awarded points along the way uh based on finishes, based on sprints at certain times during the race. Uh you've got obviously, you know, it's a team sport. You've got different teams. Do you feel at all like there's rivalries that are that are like building because of 
this as opposed to, you know, your one-off races, um, the fact that you guys are seeing each other pretty much every, every week, every few weeks, um, or is that not something at all? Um, well, at least like if you go to the best buddies and Legion situation, like that one, well, Legion isn't even part of the ACC, so they're not even getting points for, um, these races. Oh, so right. like, yeah, like they're not even <laughs> part of it. Um, so like that part of rivalry, like the series, I think has nothing to do with it gotcha. because even with or without the series, you see the same people week in and week out, even if it's a one-off race, you're going to see that same person, whether it's part of a series or not. Um, so I think like this, having a series part, that, that's rivalry is pretty much like that, that would be happening whether with or without the series. Gotcha. Do you think the fact that it's pretty much only crit racing going on right now in the U S versus road racing? I mean, I, you've done a few road events, Joe Martin, uh, you, you did that road event, obviously the U S pro road race. Were you seeing similar stuff in those races or is it more the dynamic of these four corner, less technical, less hard overall, uh, events? Yeah. Like, that's actually a good question because like Joe Martin was fine and it's a sense of the same people. Road Nat was completely fine. Um, I mean, our the crits are pretty easy. Like a lot of them are only racing sixty minutes too. So people, I guess that goes kind of back to my comment. Like people are fighting right from the beginning because it is only sixty minutes, seventy minutes maybe 80 minutes like we're not having any like 90k or 90 minute races or even like longer races like they used to have um so that it, that's changing the, the dynamic too because they're the races are so short because yeah. even like we did the one race that we did that was longer um in tc it was 100k and like aggression wise I didn't feel it was that bad. It was also technical, so it kind of got rid of all those people pretty easily. Gotcha. And how does like American crit racing? So someone who's never gone and raced in Europe, you know, you have the Kermesses. Obviously, you have the stuff that we all see on TV. How how does just like a regular Kermess compare to say a uh, you know some of these crits that you're doing as far as length, as far as courses? Um, and then second part of that question, you're just freshly back in the U S this year after being over in Europe. I know we had COVID that, that kind of derailed things, but like, what have you noticed in the, in Europe, uh, versus the U S pro Peloton in relation to all these topics we're talking about right now? Um, well, I, one difference is speed. Like people say they think our crits are fast. And then I'm like, yeah, you think it's fast. My last race I did in Europe, it was 200 K and we averaged 49 K an hour. And we've only averaged that in like one crit all year. So it's like that sum up for like speed. There's a so lot of like it. 30, like, that's like 30 miles an hour. Yeah. And we had, it wasn't like we were on one road the whole time. Like we had corners like every kilometer oh, and it was windy. So it's like the course wise, the roads are going to be smaller. So we'll like keep it like Belgium, Netherlands, since that area. Um, roads are going to be smaller. The level is just higher, so speeds are just so much faster. Um, and the courses, I mean, all the races are going to be even their Kermesses are. If you're doing the pro Kermesses, they're still 160 to 180k. So, I mean, distance is, is long for all of them. And it's not like that means speed is low. Most of those, like, especially Kermesses, most of them, like, I was, recently I was looking back at some of the, the speeds, even for those, like, even the slowest one I think I did all year was still, like, 44K an hour. And it was, we are going up the Mur, which is that climb that they, they do classic. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the we? <laughs> so, like, we, we were climbing the Mur. And then doing a, a loop with a bunch of turns and another hill, and we still average like 44k an hour. So it's like speeds are just so high. Um, so I mean, 
and the courses are just different. It's going to be a lot of turns, maybe cobbles, wind. Um, but especially at Kermista, you're turning like <laughs> pretty frequently. And they go, the difference with them is they don't rip corners. They'll go pretty slow. And then to make it harder, they'll go slow around the corner, like the leaders. And then they kind of like sprint out of it. So then if you're in like 80th wheel, you're like really sprinting out of it because <laughs> the leaders are back up to speed. So that, that's what they do too, to just get rid of people is the, if you're in the top 10, they make it so hard if you're not in the top 10. <laughs> well, that's what I, you know, that's what I feel like happens in a technical crit. You have to take yeah. the, the corners a little bit easier and then you accel mm -hmm. accelerate out of them. And then whoever is, you know, more than 10 wheels back is getting crushed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like essentially what happens in that long DC one. Cause it, it's technical. Like it's really technical. And if you're not in the top 15, you're just getting destroyed. Like there was one for quite a few laps. I like got in a bad position. I was in like 40th probably. And I just, I couldn't move. Like I was just stuck there because it would be like, you come around a corner and the leaders are going so fast. And then I'd hit the corner, be like sprinting all out, like just stuck in the wheel, just stuck in the wheel, like hoping they slow down and I can move up. Um, but it, I mean, I, I enjoy that though, because then it's not like you're getting dive bombed by some dude that shouldn't be dive bombing you and all this stuff. Because if it's hard and fast, then it's safer 100%. Yeah, for sure. Single file is uh single file is usually <laughs> safer than yeah. 10 wide. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. And like this course center is so well, DC is a prime example. Like people will say like, Oh, there was a lot of crashes. And I will agree with them. There were a lot of crashes, but it was like, it was one offs because it would be some dude that thinks he can rail a corner way past his abilities and he would slide out and be like, well, yeah, pe there were a lot of crashes in that, that day, but it was all uh, people that thought they were way better than they were and they'd go rail this corner and then they'd crash. <laughs> so <laughs> you also, gotcha. they just didn't, they just didn't know their abilities. Yeah. So that was not like aggressive in like I want to take someone out or I'm going to be so aggressive no, at holding my position that I'm going to chop wheels yeah. and I'm looking yeah. to try to take people into curbs so they can't get around me. Uh, no, none, not of, none of that. None. Of, like it was literally like somebody would come into a corner, especially like they would try to attack and they'd go into a corner and be like, buddy, I can already tell you you're going too fast. And then just, <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> give them, give them a little space. Cause they're, yeah. they're about to kiss some asphalt. Huh? Yeah. Well, cool. Is there any, so, you know, parting words is, is, uh, do you have any other, like any other things that you'd like to see kind of changed, you know, talked about more, anything like that within American crit racing right now? Um, I'd enjoy some longer races. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Let's why? bring back some. Why Let's did bring it? back our bits. I mean, why did it drop below like 90 minutes? Um, super just soft. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. There we go. Parting words. There, that's that's going to be Pardon our intro. The, uh, <laughs> no, I honestly think like the the longer and harder a race is, you know it's going to be, there's this element called pacing that you generally need to do. Uh, well, like and, just because we're doing crits doesn't, and I doesn't mean we have to only race 60 minutes like we can still race like two hours to 90 minutes mm -hmm. like that's still short enough that i i mean athens is we'll use athens twilight prime example because people like their argument is people aren't involved or get bored well athens brings out like the biggest crowd all year and that's almost a two-hour crit i mean that's just more time like, to drink beer that's gonna say yeah exactly <laughs> Like yeah. it, people are still going to come out and watch a, a 90 minute to two hour pro crit. One hundred percent. Like that's sure. not too long. Uh, and, and uh, what about as far as bringing back more road races? Let's make road racing cool again in the U S or what do you think? Um, unfortunately I think road racing is kind of dead for the next bit. Just as like a, we don't have people to put them on and the money's not there right now as sad it is is to say that 
we really just it's going to be in a dry spell for a while i think yeah it's just so it's so much more difficult yeah. mm-hmm. time consuming expensive you end up going into middle of nowhere so you're not messing yeah. with traffic <laughs> need more volunteers you need mm-hmm. more of everything yeah. yeah it's it's tough all right, last thing yeah. before we let you go, Johnny. So Johnny's doing Intelligentsia. This is your first time ever doing Intelligentsia, right? Is it Intelligentsia? First time. Oh, is it Intelligentsia or Gentsia? I think it's Intelligentsia. Got it. Whatever. Uh, so looking at those courses, what uh, first off, what course uh, are you looking most forward to? I'm assuming you've uh, taken a peek at most of the race courses. <clears throat> or you maybe put you me haven't. on the spot. Because I have not looked at one. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Johnny, man, you got to know the courses. So that was a waste. Uh, which one are we going to see fight round number two at? Hopefully none. <laughs> Johnny's like, I don't know. I have not looked at the courses. Who are you going to fight? I'm not a fighter. I'm a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> there we go. All right, my last question. Uh, who won? Who won the fight? Uh, we know who won the race, <laughs> but who won the fight the other night? You were front and center. Uh, I'm gonna. Try I was to find front that. center. I don't know. I don't know who won. They got broken up too early, I guess. They there was no winner. There really didn't seem like there was many punches landed. No. But no, there really was. If you want to go and see a, a, there's like a classic YouTube video of two cyclists yeah. fighting. <laughs> it is the funniest thing where they're doing watch like all spinning day. backhanded punches oh, yeah. and yeah, they're just flailing <laughs> and they land like zero. Uh huh. It's great. <laughs> yeah, the the cycling shoes not the best to be wearing for a throwdown. No, <laughs> no, no. And I think I think if one real good thing I think came from all this, obviously more people having a conversation. And number two, I think we've got some folks um, that realize ultimate fighting may not be their post-cycling retirement sport. Probably not. <laughs> Johnny, last words. What do you got? Anything? Just have fun. Be safe. Listen to your elders. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, like have respect for those who've who've actually had have the Palmars to. Uh, to, to be able to give you feedback. Like, I think, I think everyone can, if someone tells me something, I'm going to listen mm-hmm. and then I'll go hide in the back <laughs> <laughs> or I'll go full send in the next one. I don't know. You, you actually know how many times when I was younger, I would get yelled at and then I'd be so embarrassed that I would just go to the back. <laughs> <laughs> like a, like a puppy that just got uh, scolded. Yeah. Just Literally, like you're your like legs. the dog with the, the tail between its legs, yeah. and you're just like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> but that's probably where you learned. Like that's where you learned it all. Like, yeah. Now you really now you, you you came up through the school of hard knocks. <laughs> that's right. All right, that's all I got, Johnny. Anything else? Are you good? I'm good. All Have right, fun. Dale. You want to close this for us? Yeah. Appreciate everyone hanging out, listening, watching. We'll catch you guys next time. Adios. Peace. See ya.